Hey everyone, CPO here. In this video, I'm doing a DSG transmission service, but specifically and importantly, it's a Mark 7.5, the facelift version, 2018 and higher seven speed transmission. That's an important distinction because the process is different from the older Mark 7 six speed transmission and you need different parts, different filter, different fluids. I'm gonna reference the VW service manual just so you know all of the facts about the process, torque specs, all that stuff. So I'll go through all of that with you in this video as I do this process in my garage. All right, first things first, let's talk about what comes in the DSG service kit from Deutsche Auto Parts, which is where I got mine. I did actually try and see if I could source it locally. Uh, it's kind of a pain in the ass. Not everybody had all the parts because quite frankly, People running seven speed VWs really don't have enough miles to put service on them yet. The Audis do, so if you're looking for parts locally, try the Audi dealers first. They're probably more likely to have parts. Anyway, everything that I needed came in the kit, but just know Deutsche Auto Parts has a kit for a seven speed DSG. That's the facelift uh, version, the Mark 7.5. It is different than the Mark 7. There's an additional mechatronic unit drain plug in that kit, and then the fluid is a different spec. So once I get the car on stands, what I'm doing now is removing the noise insulation panel. Yeah, they, that's what it's called, the noise insulation panel. It's a little plastic, I don't know, dust cover or whatever. Anyway, just some Torx bolts there to get that out of there. And then uh, putting my drain tub underneath. Using a 14 millimeter, that's probably the only tool that I didn't have just readily available and most of you may or may not have. So 14 millimeter uh, to get the inspection plug out and then this is an eight millimeter for the overflow pipe. It should just be hand tight in there. Now this is the mechatronic unit drain plug. This is something you have to drain that's different on the 7.5 than the Mark 7. Be careful because this is the one thing that sort of surprised me. I did not expect that I was going to have fluid shooting out sideways at that sort of velocity. So I sort of sacrificed my hand to keep some of that fluid going down into the drain tub. But if I did that again, I would be better prepared. So here's your heads up warning on that. So now I'm going to go in to the top to replace the filter. So you got to remove the battery, the battery tray, and the uh, obviously you have to do the intake to get the battery tray out. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. Now Volkswagen uh, specs this as a lifetime filter, so they don't expect you to service this part. And because of that, it's not very easy to get to, and it's in a really awkward place. And even worse so than the Mark 7 and the 6-speed DSG, this one is even worse, and I'll show you why here in a second. But anyway, getting the battery out, pretty easy. There are three Torx screws and then one little nut to get it out. They should all be pretty easy to spot. Matter of fact, I'm gonna save the third Torx screw until after I get this intake off. The intake I'm running is the IE Cold Air Intake version two. Really like this intake. Get that out of the way because it actually clips onto the battery tray. That's what holds the intake in. So got to move that so that we can get the battery tray out. There's that third Torx screw. And then you'll probably have to pull apart some of your wiring harness clips off of the battery tray to get it out. May as well check your brake fluid while you're in there. It's a good, good time to look at that since you finally have some decent access to it. And hey, if you want to do motor transmission mounts, whatever. Anyway, back there in the back, pointing backwards and sideways is a oil filter, a transmission oil filter housing uh, with a aluminum heat shield on it. The heat shield is going to come off with the housing and it's going to be messy because it's actually got transmission fluid in it and it's sideways. So the only way to get it out is to pull it backwards and let transmission fluid run out over the back. Uh, so I tried to, you know, put some shop towels in to keep things from getting too messy inside the engine bay. And that really wasn't that big of an issue, to be honest with you. That's a 24 millimeter socket back there to get that off. It's just a plastic housing. 
and I have a little Ziploc bag there to put it in so I don't have to take it very far before I get it contained. Now, you're going to want to put a drain pan in the back middle underneath the car because fluid will run out. Like right around the dog bone area is, uh, is where most of the fluid came out, the rear of the dog bone. So that's where I would make sure you had some ability to catch fluid. Just uh, dumping everything out and then uh, cleaning up whatever residual oil I could, which wasn't too bad on the top. But again, a lot of that stuff runs down the back of the transmission. And there's really just no way about it. Like even the service manual mentions like, hey, you're, <laughs> you're gonna leak fluid. So anyway, remove the old O-ring. And then I'm just using a little of that oil inside the housing to lubricate the new O-ring that came with the uh, ShopDap kit and putting it on. You can technically plug the filter into the transmission first and then put the housing on. They don't lock together like some do. Just make sure that collar's forward. If you put the filter inside the housing and then get the housing lined up and then screwed in, it will insert the filter for you. I did check that. I backed the housing off just to check and make sure the filter did go into place like it's supposed to in seat, and it does. Just tighten that up. I tightened it up as much as I could by hand and then I used my little ratchet to tighten it up the rest of the way. There is an official torque spec on this, but good luck getting a torque wrench back there. So uh, you'll tell uh, when it gets actually to a point where it's tight. And then I just gave it uh, a, little, a little bump past tight. Uh, but be careful, you can over tighten those and crack. Uh, it's just plastic. So now I'm buttoning this back up. Battery tray goes back in, intake goes back together. Uh, and then, then the battery. So meanwhile, everything underneath is still just draining out of those holes. The, the main fill slash inspection hole and then the mechatronic unit hole is just down there dripping at this point. All right, so now back underneath, I'm putting in the new mechatronic unit drain plug with its built-in washer. It comes with its own little captured, like a brass gasket. Torque spec on this and then another 45 degree turn, so torque it to the value and then give it another 45 degrees. And that will get that knocked out. Now I'm gonna go ahead and put in the overflow pipe. Now the spec on this, and this is something that's different with the seven speed versus the six speed, and that is the gear oil level is properly set when the overflow pipe is unscrewed two turns. So the level is two turns below full. So I went ahead and screwed it in all the way here just to fill it up. But when I do my final fluid level setting, I will go in and unscrew that, back it off two turns for the final setting. So I got that in just hand tight there. And then I'm gonna plug in the adapter for the oil filler. Now I got this oil filler off Amazon. It's one with the funnel. I like this idea because it allows it to be less of a unitasker. I can use it for other projects. And I happen to have hooks for my bikes hanging on the garage ceiling. So it worked out well with a bungee cord to be able to hold that as high as possible. Shaking the fluid per the instructions and then just filling it up. And obviously the higher you get it, the quicker it will go. And it went really quick. It, I've heard like, it seems like people complain it's a slow and painful process. It went by pretty quick. Uh, one of the keys is if you can keep air from getting in that line, then it'll go a lot faster. Once you get an air bubble in there, it slows to a crawl. So if you can keep it uh, with fluid going without air bubble, it'll go pretty quickly. Leaving all of that in, the hose, the filler, all that stuff is in. I'm just hanging the funnel from the ceiling. Get in, start the vehicle, and then I'm gonna run it through the gears, obviously starting in park, and then neutral for three seconds, and then reverse for three seconds, and then neutral for three seconds, and then drive for three seconds and then sport for three seconds and back to drive and back to neutral and back to reverse and back to park. Meantime, I'm also loading up my OBD-11 so that I can check the fluid temperature. Fluid temperature has to be between 35 and 45 degrees Celsius. And so it turns out that's pretty much ambient temperature for me. So yeah, uh, I'm dead on at 41 degrees Celsius right now. Uh, and I'm gonna go straight to setting my level. So I'm unscrewing the hose now and just letting all that excess oil drain into the collection bucket. And then this is where, unfortunately, my hose landed in exactly the wrong spot in the camera view, but I am backing out 
that overflow tube by two turns. You can see it with the Allen wrench there, two turns. All right, hey, so let's stop right here uh, and address something that's potentially confusing. Uh, I know it was for me and a lot of other people seem to get hung up on this overflow pipe thing and whether or not you should actually back out two turns, whether or not the color of your overflow pipe matters, whether you have a gray one or a red one. It seems like there is an assumption that the early pipes were gray and that's why you had to back it out two turns and since then they've made a red pipe which is shorter that you don't have to back out. Like, I don't know if that's true or not. But what I did do is I went down to my local Volkswagen service shop at the dealer nearby, talked to their head tech, their grand poobah, I don't know what his official title is. Smart guy, knew what he's talking about. Look up the manual with me. And this manual that I have here is correct. And basically what he says is, whatever color overflow pipe your car comes with is the right color for your car. He says he has no idea why they change colors, but whatever one is installed from the factory is the one you should use. And the instructions don't change depending on the color of your overflow pipe. So whether it's red or it's gray, they treat them the same way. So that was an interesting point to note. On top of that, he said, first of all, they don't check customers' fluid levels. If a customer comes in and wants their fluid level checked, the only thing they're going to be able to do is do a complete fluid level change. And I get that. That makes a lot of sense. He doesn't know what kind of fluid they have in there or anything else about that. It's safer for them to just change it out and then know that it's got the right spec fluid and it's at the right level. So with that said, all they do is do changes. When they do changes, they screw the overflow pipe in all the way, which is what I did in this video and what the instructions state. They use that as the level and then they put in the inspection plug and they're done. What they don't do as a matter of practice is go in after the fact, unscrew it two turns, and then level set or quote, check the level at that point. And that also makes sense. So here's the thing. My assumption is the actual level in the manual, as stated, is two turns below the top of the overflow pipe. How it gets there can probably take place in a couple of ways. One could be unscrewing at two turns and going straight there, like I did. Uh, which is what the manual does. It takes you from uh, filling the fluid and then takes you to the section, page 127, that tells you to now unscrew it two turns and check the level. Or the other way would be just to leave it fully inserted and let it naturally sort of slosh around and lose a bit of level through the course of driving. And that's probably fine too. Either way, everybody I talk to says, we're talking about a couple of millimeters here. It's not going to make a difference regardless at that point. So whether or not you choose to do it the way I do in this video, which is screw it all the way in, fill it up, back it off two turns to do the final check, and then screw it back in, and then put your inspection plug in. Or if you choose to just screw it all the way in, fill it up, let that be the level that's set at, and then put your inspection plug in, Either one is going to be fine. I did it the way the book says. Not everybody follows it precisely as the book says, and that seems to be okay. So there you go. I just wanted to point that out because I know that that's going to generate some discussion, uh, especially in the future when more and more people start doing these changes and people start to question whether or not gray versus red, two turns versus no turns. That's the story. I think you're okay either way. I went step by step through the instructions and it is what it is. My car drives great, so yeah. But I am backing out that overflow tube by two turns. You can see it with the Allen wrench there, two turns, letting everything come out. As soon as the flow stops, then I'm tightening it back in hand tight and then putting in the 
inspection plug with a new crush washer that comes in the kit to finish everything off. Now it looks like there's fluid coming out whenever I am putting in the overflow tube, but it was really just a, every 30 seconds or so it'll spurt fluid. I just happened to time putting it up there when it was splurting. So, but the actual like fluid level had already sort of settled. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. Go in and put my noise insulation panel back in and then get the car off the lift. Took it for a test drive, everything was great. Totally doable uh, in the garage. Like I was worried, I see a lot of people doing this on a lift and I'm like, oh, how tight is it gonna be to do this on a garage floor? But yeah, at least, you know, I'm using obviously four jack stands and uh, they're not all the way extended, but they're fairly high. Uh, I had plenty of room under there. I didn't feel like it was too cramped at all. Absolutely total, total doable job. I think it probably took me, I don't know, two to three hours to do start to finish if you get rid of like time that I spent moving a camera around and doing other random things. But uh, it wasn't horrible at all. And uh, just take your time, follow the steps, pay attention to the smaller details, and yeah, should go well for you. Now, normally the service interval is 80,000 miles. A lot of people that run their cars hard, especially in the tuning community, tend to do it at half that at 40,000 miles. I'm at about 32,000 miles and I'm doing it a little bit early. I was pretty hard on this transmission in the first year and a half or so because I was running stage two with factory software. So I thought it would be a good idea just to double check and make sure that there were no issues, no metal shavings, no burnt smell or anything like that. And then also just freshen everything up. So, I mean, it was 180 bucks, give or take, uh, to do the job myself. And I think totally worth it. So anyway, guys, that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next one.